All right, well, good evening, everyone. I know you guys are like, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be over there. I'll be over there in just a second. Uh, I need to take just a few minutes tonight and uh, let you guys know that uh, we're going to have a special called business meeting next Wednesday night. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the Lord in the last week and a half has laid a great opportunity in front of us, and so we want to be able to take advantage of that uh, if we can, if the church votes for us to do that. Um, the Long Range Planning Team will be bringing a recommendation uh, that we, and I'm going to go ahead and pull the slide up, if you will. So this is the property that we currently own. Now, if you look, if you look on Wildwood, there's that one green square, 211 Crest Drive, that I know our church has tried to purchase for a lot of years. And that purchase would allow us to finish off that entire street so that we would own everything on that side of the street. And so uh, one of our church members got a phone call about a week and a half ago uh, letting us know before it went on market that that was going to become available. And so uh, we immediately uh, got our long range planning team together and met about that with our trustees as well. And they were unanimous that we should purchase that piece of property to finish off that street. Um, and that would allow us with our expansion to continue to expand, to continue to, continue to uh, provide more parking, which is what we'll need to do uh, after we get all of our other building finished. Uh, it will not affect any of, our, any of our plans or any of our fundraising or any of our money that we're using in the uh, For Generations to Come program. Okay, so I don't want to confuse those two things. Uh, this, this would be paid for, uh, it would be $295,000 would be the purchase price of that property and that's what was negotiated down uh, and it would be paid for out of our general fund uh, we have a current general fund balance of 1.6 million dollars and that's just general that's just general fund money that's sitting there and so lord's been very gracious to us uh, in that respect and so that's that that's not any money that is designated or anything like that at all that's just uh, overflow and so we would be able to uh, take care of that out of our general fund and not get involved with uh, our building fund or anything like that. Okay, so we will be dis so we will be discussing and voting on that next Wednesday at the beginning of our Bible study time. So, per our Constitution and bylaws, uh, we have to we have to provide that information for you a week ahead of time, and so we want to do that tonight. Um, this uh, a sheet just like this with the recommendation and the plot will be available for you guys uh, back at the Welcome Center where we normally have this information if you'd like to uh, get one of those uh, that will be there. And uh, we will make sure you have that. And then next Wednesday at the beginning of our business meeting, our beginning, beginning of prayer meeting, we'll take some time to make the motion. We're going to go into business, make the motion, have some discussion, vote, and then we'll get into our Bible study time. Okay? All right? Amen. I tell you guys, I, I know probably some of you all like I was, was like, man, this is all kind of coming on. But here's the exciting thing about that. When the Lord begins to kind of roll the snowball, it just things start happening. And I know that uh, I've heard from some people that we've tried to get that piece of property before and we, it's basically she told us she would not sell to the church. And, and so now uh, she called us to say, hey, I want you guys to know it's available before it hits the market. So we really feel like that's a, that's a God move for us. God's in that for us. So anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that next uh, Wednesday night, and then we'll vote on it, and then we'll, if it's, if it's approved, we'll move forward. Okay? All right. Thank you guys so much. You guys have a great Bible study. Because these will be out in the Welcome Center area for you guys to pray. Okay. Pastor Jeff? Yes, sir. Before you go, I want to tell you a quick story. It goes along with what you're saying. Years ago, there was a pastor at First Baptist Church in Dallas. His name was Wally Amos Criswell, W.A. Criswell. Yeah. And one day, Dr. Criswell was going out to get in his car, and he saw a guy putting up a sign on a big old parking lot. <laughs> he told the guy, take the sign down, we'll buy it. <laughs> and that's before they ever had to, <laughs> and he just went in. Of course, he, he was pastor there for over 50 years, so he could do that. <laughs> he didn't have to have a call business meeting. Let's all vote on it. But can you imagine just, sir, Take your sign down. We'll buy it. <laughs> Amen, people. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. You know, I love how the Lord does things. You know, sometimes we got to put on our seatbelt and hold on for the ride, baby. 
You know, some of us were too slow moving, aren't we? Huh? The older we get, we're a little slow, but the Lord sometimes moves fast. So, anyway. Amen? Y'all need to get excited about something. I'm telling you what, sometimes God bless America, you know. Boy, would y'all get excited if Jesus were coming tonight? No. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, you know what the old boy said? Say, preacher, I get excited, but let's don't get that bus up tonight. Let's wait a little lot longer. <laughs> I don't get that bus load loaded up tonight. Let me go over and share with you tonight um, just some prayer requests. Um, uh, thank, thank the good Lord. We got a little, got someone, uh, Colby As Aslop, uh, came forward in the 10 o'clock service on Sunday uh, by baptism uh, to become a part of our church family. And some of the current prayer requests is Gary Davis, a former special needs church member. On 9-13-23, he moved to Mississippi and found out he had advanced stages of bladder cancer and have started chemo treatments. Please be in prayer for him. And then uh, Phyllis Denny on 9-13 had some very unspoken requests uh, that uh, desired for us to pray for and of course I know y'all probably saw Marilyn earlier over here tonight I think she's uh, doing better uh, she was sitting there before went back and uh, uh, Marilyn Callis I should say and so just remember those in prayer anybody else have somebody you want to add to the prayer sheet we need to be praying about everything going on in the church uh, all the events and as the Lord moves upon the hearts of people about um, giving and, and projections or whatever the Lord might have upon the hearts of people to do in the weeks ahead. <clears throat> okay. Good. Good. Good, good. That's good. Back in the back. Good. Super duper. I had a luncheon last year. Um, I don't mean to make light of the knee, but I had a luncheon last year with a whole bunch of guys that I played football with many, many years ago. And the first statement the host gave us, we were at this country club sitting, let's go around and see how many replacements everyone has had. <laughs> You know, that's a great way to start off lunch. Hey, let's go around and see how many replacements everybody's had, you know. And so it's amazing the older you get, you know, all the different things that happen to these old bodies we got. But anyway, praise the Lord, they're still working along. Okay, anybody, anything else? Yes. Ugh, tomorrow. Okay. Oldest son, hip replacement, tomorrow. Okay. A week from tomorrow. Okay. There you go. Hard of hearing, too, you know. Uh, somebody else? Anybody else? Anybody else tonight? Okay. Okay, why don't we just bow and pray together? Why don't you just uh, take, take just a moment there by yourself there in the pew and, and just uh, pray the Lord. Father, there's so many things that uh, are on our hearts, not just those that we've mentioned tonight, Lord, not just those that are on a piece of paper, not just those that are spoken, or, but, Lord, all those that are unspoken. And, Lord, even we praise you and thank you already for this property becoming available for the church. And, Lord... Uh, you know, obviously your hand has moved upon someone to allow the church to purchase that. And so, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for um, the things you're doing in this body of believers. We thank you, Lord, for those that have come to be a part of this church family. We thank you, Lord, for those that have come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and want to pronounce their faith by following you and believers' baptism here within this body of believers. Father, we already thank you for those that are going to be coming into this fellowship in the days ahead, Lord, because you are wooing their hearts and drawing them into this fellowship of believers. And Father, we just uh, praise you and thank you that you are the Lord of all things. 
And tonight as we open up your book and uh, we look into your book, Lord, we pray that you might um, cause our hearts and our minds to be clear, uh, to be concise, and to be able to understand uh, the truths that you uh, have for us tonight, Lord. And Lord, we just uh, want to declare again, as we have many times today, how much we love you, how much we thank you for all the many, many blessings you've blessed us with, Lord. And Father, we just, uh, we just thank you so much that uh, you bring us comfort. Uh, Lord, that you are always there for us. You never forsake us or leave us. And so we just ask that tonight as we open up your book, Lord, you might direct us and lead us in these verses of Scripture that are before us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, tonight, whenever you take this last, uh, this last chapter of James, I thought that tonight was going to be our last night that I would be with you. And that the pastor informed me that, nope, you need to do something next Wednesday night. I said, okay, we'll do something next Wednesday night. So... Uh, um, so we had started off, we missed, the rest of the church missed one Wednesday night because of the cat, the fair, remember? Everything was canceled except this group. And so, um, so the grandparenting class uh, was canceled and the other things. And so that's why they're a little behind and we're a little ahead. So, so tonight we're looking at James uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, closing out this book. And uh, let me just read this to us, and then we'll come back and kind of go through it verse by verse. It says, if, is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The affected, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now in each one of those verses, except the last two verses, the word prayer is used. So you go verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, all the way to verse 19, every verse except 19 and 20, the word prayer is used over and over. And so we're gonna take the verse where he says that the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that's kind of what we're going to use as kind of like a title for the Bible study tonight. And he says, first of all, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing song. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So the first thing I want us to look at is, is what I've called how uh, fervent prayer brings comfort. From verse 13 to verse 15a, the first part of that verse, it says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now, before we begin tonight, let me just say this for all of us. <clears throat> probably, I think, I'm, I'm giving you my personal belief, probably one of the hardest things in our journey as believers is prayer. And the reason it's probably one of the hardest things is because there are so many noises in our lives. 
And so it's very difficult to cut out all the noises. And I'm not just talking about noises that you hear, but the noises of your brain. So, as you recall, in the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> Jesus, one of the things that he always did, he went to a solitary place to pray. And that means that was a place where there wasn't a lot of uh, noise, there wasn't a lot of uh, things going on. And he probably went very early in the morning. And, and I personally think that one of the most difficult things um, is prayer because so many times we have so many noises. And the second thing, we so often just pray for ourselves. Amen? That's an amen. <laughs> we pray more about ourselves than anything else because what we know the most about is us. Amen? Our families. And so, so what we do so often is we just pray um, for ourselves and, it, and it's hard it, it, it's difficult. I have known some great, great prayer warriors. Um, and I honestly believe that one day when we go to heaven, I think some of the, the renowned Christ followers are going to be the prayer warriors. And there might be some of the people that you never saw behind a pulpit, you never saw in a Sunday school class. Uh, it's going to be people that just were prayer warriors. And um, I knew a woman that had a son that was a drunk, that was an alcoholic. And every night while he was still living at home, she would stay up in her living room in a rocking chair praying. And she would pray for her son. And even when he would come in with abusive language towards his own mother, she would continue to pray. Until finally, one day he wanted to date this young lady. And the only way the young lady would date him was for him to come to the rescue mission where she played the piano for the services there. And he said he was not going to stoop himself that low to go to a rescue mission. But mother continued to pray. This young lady continued to say, only way I'm going to date you, you got to come to the rescue mission. And so finally he went to the rescue mission, looked at all those people there and said, I'm not like those people. But as time went by, because of the prayers of a mother and the conviction of a young lady, that man came to know Christ. And when he came to know Christ, it turned his life inside out. Today, all over Wilson County, you will see car washes. <laughs> all these there's car washes springing up everywhere. Amen? But do you remember years ago, you would go into these car wash bays, and you would put in your quarters, and there would be a wand that you would pull out, and you would wash off your car. Or it had one that had the suds that would come out. That person that invented that all across the country is the man I'm talking about. And then he invented whenever you would buy a brand new automobile, many automobile dealers would put the name of a bank as the floor mat within that car as a cardboard floor mat so that that person purchasing that automobile might go to that bank to get their loan on that automobile. And that same man was the man that took me to Asheville, North Carolina when I was about 16 years of age to give my testimony in a church. <laughs> Can you imagine? I was scared to death. But I traveled with that man for one summer driving him, going into banks to where they were be giving him deals to where he was producing floor mats and also doing these car washes all across the United States. And I'll never forget we were in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we pulled into a gas station, and he pulled out a New Testament, and he said to the guy there at the pump, said, do you ever read this Bible, <laughs> this little thing? And the guy said, no, but I need to, sir. And so we went in to that guy's place. We'd just come out of a banking 
situation dressed in suits and we got down on our knees with that guy that day and that guy prayed in that place to receive Christ we gave him a Bible and shared now, I share that story with you to tell you what happens with fervent prayer a mama that loved a boy that didn't give up on a boy that kept on praying for that boy prayers hard Prayer sometimes is difficult, and sometimes we want to give up and quit. We have a person in our Sunday school class that has greatly touched me. I won't mention his name, but those in the class know who he is. And he doesn't talk a lot. But I'll never forget one Sunday in Sunday school class, he said, I prayed for 10 years before the Lord gave me an answer about my prayer. And I thought to myself, my Lord, I'd have probably given up after a year or six months. You know what I'm saying? But prayed for 10 years. So my point is this, is, is prayer is tough. And sometimes we don't always, sometimes it is God's business to rearrange our heart and our mind and our request for those things that we're praying for. Not always. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we are aligned with the Lord in our prayer life. So let's begin and just look at what he says here. He says, if, if somebody's suffering, and he's talking to people who've been persecuted. He's talking to Christians who've had trials and tribulations. He said, if you are suffering, you need to pray. He said, if you are happy because of God's blessings, you need to sing psalms and praise the Lord and just bless the Lord all day and night and thank the Lord for his goodness. And he says, is anyone among you that is sick, then let him call for the elders of the church. Now, that means either people in positions of leadership, might be other pastors, it might be deacons. Call these men of God and let them come and pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, there is no, uh, sometimes, uh, Oil was used medicinally. Uh, olive oil was used all the time, many times for medicinal purposes. But there's not any magic or healing in the oil itself. And what he is saying here is that if someone is sick, and, and I've had this experience personally with people who have asked me to come to their home, uh, with other men, men that they desired to pray for them, and I've had people say, uh, would you mind touching me with oil of some kind? I've done that before. Um, and yet I've wanted to always make sure that they understood in this passage of Scripture, when he uses this, he's not so much asking that God remove the sickness or illness as much as it is that God will bring them comfort through that which they go through. Now, sometimes the Lord will remove that. I remember a lady, sweetest, lovely, beautiful lady who was, uh, she was an interior decorator that uh, did all this stuff for Southern Accent magazines and had a beautiful home. And she asked us, London, myself, and a couple other men to come to her house one day. She had, had cancer. She was uh, making trips to MD Anderson in Houston. And, uh, she wanted us to come and pray for her, and we did. And she had a pure heart, and we prayed, and uh, God did not remove the cancer, uh, but God did give her comfort and solace as she went through that window of time for a long window of time. Now, I've seen this also. I have seen before where I am very cautious personally about going into a hospital or into a room of sickness or illness and acting as though I know what God's will is. There are times in which you can pray and I believe the Holy Spirit of God will touch you in a way to know how to pray for that person. I'll never forget one day a lady was going in for surgery and for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit laid upon my heart that I was going to pray that she was going to be healed. And that was not going to be um, 
experienced it of pain and suffering that she was going to have and so so sure enough she went in they opened her up bang nothing was there it's all gone whatever was there before and all the x-rays all the wasn't there so just always be mindful of this be very cautious and very careful to ever try to give someone a blessing of relief from the sickness or illness because sometimes God just wants to give us comfort through the sickness or illness and yet sometimes God does want to remove it but we have to be so aligned with the Lord and that, that's a cautious place because I've seen I had a couple in my church one time and they had left the church and they had left the church because in all sincerity they had fasted they had prayed they had believed God and they had been told if they had enough faith then their child would be healed and when their child wasn't healed after fasting and praying and everything else they knew to do they weren't going to have anything to do with God I, I could count on more than two hands of people I've known that have gone down those roads before and so when I began to minister to that couple about their child and their children and especially this one child um, I really just had to love them and woo their hearts and embrace them and empathize with them when it comes to prayer it's hard to have empathy in your prayer unless you've had pain in your life. And pain is a great producer of empathy, sympathy, love, and prayer. So James is saying here, he says, bring in the elders, bring in the pastors, Anoint in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save. And when he says the word save in verse 15 in this King James New Translation, save the sick, it means deliver them from their suffering because they have been weakened by their infirmity, not from their sin, which has already been confessed. We see that in the very next verse. And so he says this prayer of faith will save them. It will relieve them from the sickness, the hardship that they're going through. And the Lord will raise them up. And then he says, as we go to the next part of the outline, he says, and if he has committed sins, it will be forgiven. So the first part about prayer, prayer is to bring comfort to our hearts. Secondly, prayer is to bring contrition. If a person is, is seeking prayer and God to do something in their lives then they have already with a contrite heart it says there in verse 15 latter part in verse 16 they have already confessed their sins there's a mutual honesty and openness and these sins have been forgiven and they're not forgiven by the elders or the, by the pastor or by the deacons or anybody in the church if there is a contrite heart a repentant heart it is that part, it is that time where, where these people, that pastor and these others have seen that person's confession and they know their heart is so pure. And so, so prayer brings, it brings a contrite heart. I was talking to my friend Rick down here earlier and, and we were talking about this little lady who was a missionary. Um, she was a missionary in China. Uh, for Southern Baptist for many, many years. Her name was Miss Bertha Smith. And she wrote a book on the Shantung Revival. And I don't know if you've ever heard about Miss Bertha Smith, but she was, she was locked up in China. She was in jail. She was in prison for a long, long time. But Miss Bertha, I, I spent some time with Miss Bertha at her place. She had a house in Calpin, South Carolina, and she had a prayer retreat called Penile. And people would go there, and pastors would go there, people would go there. And <laughs> I remember one time I was there with three or four guys, and, and, and she said to us, now I want to give you all, all I'm going to give you a legal pad. And said, I want you to take a legal pad and a pen, I want you to go out in the prayer garden and get along with God, and I want you to begin to write down all the sin that God shows you in your life. <laughs> 
And one preacher, God bless him, he said, Miss Bertha, I don't, I don't think I'm going to need that legal pad. You get alone with God, you might need two of them. <laughs> she was very direct. I mean, you just, I used to tell people, don't ask Miss Bertha a question unless you want a straight answer. But when he talks about this in this passage, he, he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's where he brings in this effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so where there is this confession of sin, this person already has a contrite heart. They're, they're, they're praying, deliver them, Lord, from their suffering because they have been weakened by their infirmities, not, so, not from their sin, which has already been confessed. Now, the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that the Lord loves his children. And the Lord loves us probably much more many times than even our earthly fathers and mothers. Because the Bible says that as God loves his children, if his children get out of line, he's liable to spank them. <laughs> That's not exactly the translation. It says he will chasten them. And so, so sometimes if somebody gets sick or ill, um, that doesn't mean they've got sin. It doesn't mean that. And be cautious and careful if you ever think that. Sometimes if there's sin in their life, they're going to know their sin, and they'll know that that's the reason whatever's happening, happening. This guy called me the other day, just this week, and uh, he said, I want you to call a buddy of ours, and I want you to pray for him because his wife is going to have surgery on Monday up in Ohio. And, uh, and I hadn't talked to this guy probably in 40-some years. We had played ball together, and his wife was having cancer surgery on her eye. Probably have to take her eye out. And so, so I called up this buddy. Call me back today. I prayed with him on the phone, prayed for his wife, and told him I'd call at him next week. And, and I remember as I was praying with him, he just started weeping on the phone. I mean, here he is up in Ohio somewhere, and I'm down here, and, and he just started weeping. And he was weeping because he's hurting, because somebody he loves and he cares about is going to have to go in for this kind of surgery. And so this thing of we confess our sins to one another and we pray for one another that you may be healed. Um, years ago, I had, some, I had a, a, a friend who had been a, an alcoholic for a long, long time. He was the top of the top in the United States. I, I, you know, he, was, he was a national sales manager for one of Fortune 500 countries. And he had been sent by the CEO of that company to Betty Ford out in California. He had gone through all this rehab stuff. And so I began to walk with him because he asked, would you walk with me through this window of time of my trying to get my life straightened out? And so in Alcoholics Anonymous, there are times in which they have what's called open meetings. And an open meeting is where another person can go to the meeting that is not a recovering alcoholic. And I'll never forget going to some of those open meetings with him during that window of time. And I was amazed at the honesty of those people. And if somebody wasn't being honest, they would call them out. <laughs> and I used to say, Lord, if we had that in a Southern Baptist church in a Sunday school class, I mean, God would get a hold of us and do something miraculous. Now, this same guy today, he's got like, I bet he's got 35, 36 years sober. But what I saw was I saw what it says in the passage. It says, confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed, that God's going to help you. And so he says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so for all of us, we are, to, we are to pray. We are to pray for one another. Um, I told Linda, I said, I don't know what's going on with me, but last week, so I've been, 
I normally sleep like a baby all night long, but I've been waking up like three in the morning for some reason. I don't know why, three o'clock, three o'clock. And so for about an hour or so, I just, I just pray. There's a lot of folks to pray for, a lot of situations to pray for. Just pray, you know? And so all of us, in, in, we need to pray. And notice what happens. We go to the next verse and watch this with me. If we have, if we're praying that God would bring us comfort and, and not necessarily healing or total release from whatever, but God is bringing us comfort. And God sometimes will bring us total release from whatever it is. Then there is that contrite heart. We have a heart that's pure because our sin is confessed and we know what it's been and, and we're open and honest with the Lord and everyone else. And then in this next part, he brings in Elijah in verse 17. He said, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I love that verse. He said, Elijah was a man just like us. He's got the same kind of nature, but he prayed earnestly. He prayed effectively and he would not rain and he did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. And so prayer brings confidence. When we begin to pray and see God answering prayer, Years ago, there was a preacher down in Titusville, Florida. He was there for many, many years. His name was Peter Lord. And Peter Lord wrote a book called 2959, which was you were to pray 29 minutes and 59 seconds. I don't know where he came up with that, but anyway. And in that prayer book, every week, it was outlined how you prayed. One day you were praying for missionaries. One day you were praying for your pastor and church staff. You were praying for lost people. I mean, it was, and then the interesting thing about his prayer book that I always thought was so interesting is that you put down your prayer request and you put the date. And then you put down when God answered that prayer. Either no, yes, or whatever. And I, I'm sure... Rick, did you ever have somebody, some church or somebody wanted you to come to their church or do something and you say, well, I'm going to pray about it, you know? And, and, and sometimes when I was young, uh, I would write those things down and some of those things I really wanted to do. It was like, oh boy, this is going to be great, you know? And I want to tell you something, if God had given me the desires of my fleshly heart, it had been a mess. <laughs> And a lot of times the things we pray for, I'm telling you, if we got what we were wanting at that moment in time, it would be a unbelievable mess. Now we don't know that at that moment in time because we don't have that globe to look into the future, but God's already looking into the future for us. He already knows everything about us. And so here's Elijah, he's a man just like us and he prays and, and there's this confidence because he prays and God withholds the rain and then he prays again and God brings the rain. Now it was God's will and God used Elijah in this way and Elijah provided one of the most notable illustrations of power of prayer in the Old Testament. Um, and we see this, this three years and six month drought and we see it in Luke 4.25. And, and so he uses this as an introduction to the people within the body of Christ that we pray. So it brings confidence. Um, when I was young, there was a church down in Bossier City, Louisiana, and they had come to talk to me, and they wanted me to think about and pray about becoming their pastor. And, man, I thought, oh, it's going to be great going to Bossier City, Louisiana. And I didn't know anything about Bossier City, Louisiana. And then I just think, oh, it's going to be great, 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 great. And I prayed, and I put it down in my little prayer book, pray, 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 pray. And fortunately, the Lord didn't allow me to do that, in which I was blessed, because if I had done it, it would have been a mess, <laughs> a royal mess. So sometimes in our lives, whatever we're praying for, we have to be careful that we're not praying in the flesh. And the only way you can not pray in the flesh is you got to put yourself in neutral. It's hard to get into neutral 
because you've already got a selective idea of what you want that you're praying for. And so sometimes we just have to push up into neutral and say, now, Lord, I'm not really sure about this. I'm not sure if this is the right thing or the wrong thing, but Lord, I want you through your spirit and through your word to direct me. I want to give you one little simple thing. There's, God has given us a Bible, and this is his word. God has placed within us the Holy Spirit when we became a Christian. The Holy Spirit supersedes all the authorship of this book. So if the Lord is wanting to direct us into doing something, whether it's praying for something specifically, whether it's ministering, whatever it might be, then God is going to direct us through this book through the Holy Spirit. So you can always know if it's of God, then it will be substantiated by this book and by the Holy Spirit because he will never ask you to do anything that is contrary to this book and the Holy Spirit will never lead you in that direction. So we have great confidence in fervent prayer. So we go to these last two verses, <laughs> and prayer is not mentioned here, but I put in here that fervent prayer will bring conversion. Now, obviously, you have to be prayed up <laughs> to approach this. Did I ever tell you all the story about Billy Graham and his son Franklin about prayer? I told you all that story. I got so many stories. Um, <laughs> when Billy Graham was, uh, Billy Graham gave a, gave, um, did a crusade in Knoxville, Tennessee, way back there, probably in 1969, I think, and did it at Nayland Stadium, and his son was named Franklin. He's the guy you see with Samaritan's Purse all the time now, Franklin. And Franklin had a little red MG. And Franklin came over from Montreat to, from Asheville over, from, Asheville, from Montreat, North Carolina, over to the crusade. And I always thought it was the coolest thing in the world to see Billy Graham. Billy Graham always had the biggest Bible. I don't know if you ever saw his Bible. But it was always, it was always like double spaced and the letters were huge. That's why he could always stand back real far and read his Bible because the Bible was so double-spaced, big, I mean, it's the biggest type I'd ever seen in my life. He had a special done. And so I always thought it was the coolest thing to see Billy get in that MJ, M, MG with, with Franklin. Is it either MG or, or Triumph? I can't remember which. It was a red one, and he would go down to the stadium in that car, and old Billy's hair be just blowing in the breeze. I thought, man, isn't that cool? That's just the coolest thing. You know, I'm a college kid, you know what I'm saying? I think, it is really cool seeing this, you know? And of course, then they had Johnny Cash there, and I got to, you know, spend some time with Johnny Cash. That was cool, too. I went up and said, Mr. Cash, I'd like to... My name is Johnny Cash. You know, well, yeah, I know that, <laughs> you know, but... So anyway, I'll never forget, Billy was just a little boy. I mean, Franklin was a little boy, and so um, they had a missionary family staying with them, spending the night with them at Montreat, their house. And so the next morning, I got up for breakfast. Ruth had fixed breakfast for all of them, and they were having breakfast. And before they had breakfast, Billy called on the missionary to pray. Well, the missionary, he just prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed some more. And finally, they had breakfast. I don't know if the eggs got cold or not, but they, they finally had breakfast. And so after the missionary left, Franklin at least had enough manners. He said, Daddy, said, why did that missionary pray so long? And Billy, with a real sense of humor, said, well, son, I guess he had to catch up on his prayer life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so sometimes, you know, somebody just go on and on and on. I'll tell y'all one other funny story now. I'll shut up and we'll move on to this last point. I'm pastor of the church and, and I'm young and I'm stupid and never worse than I am now. And we're on television. We got television cameras and all that stuff. And so I had this deacon came forward. You know, they, they bring the offering down. Years ago, we'd always bring the offering down. Remember when you had the offering plates and you bring them down, you put them on the Lord's Supper table down there, you know, da, da, da. And so this one deacon came down there one week and had the offering place and everything. And so, so you got to understand, we're on television. I'm right here like I am right now. And I called on him to pray. 
And this is what he said. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Lord, this is old J.W. down here. <laughs> and I mean to tell you, I had to bend over. I scared those cameras. I was just up there just dying laughing. <laughs> But this is old J.W. down here, and I said, oh, man, that's a guy from my own heart, man. I tell you, I loved old J.W. Uh, but anyway, I think sometimes we need to understand that the Lord knows all about us. And sometimes we need to say, Lord, here I am, and Lord, I'm prayed up. And there's a brother or a sister, and it says here, if anyone among you wanders from the truth... And someone turns him back. Now, when he talks about this, when he wanders from the truth, he's talking about someone that is apostatizing the faith. They, they once professed Christ, but these people are in grave danger. And so the church must call them back to their faith. And so the way in which they do that is, as he says, you go to that person and you go and talk to them about their relationship with Christ. And James has in mind here those who were dead in their faith. Uh, these were not true believers, but they were part of the church. And so he begins to talk to them. We're to talk to them about their relationship with Christ. And notice what it says. It says, let him know that he who turns. Now, you're not actually saving the person, but you're presenting Christ to the person so that that person might turn from the direction of which they're going for this person has wandered from the truth and they have put their souls in jeopardy and the word death here is not physical death it is eternal death that he's talking about he's talking about eternal punishment eternal hell is what he's talking about and so he says eternal separation from god eternal punishment and hell knowing how these stakes are so high so we as christians should do everything that we can to aggressively move towards those people. And then it says here, it says it will cover if that person comes back or comes to the Lord, as Psalms 510 says, it will cover a multitude of sins. So one of the hardest things to do is to go to a brother or sister and talk to them about their faith if they've wandered away, or maybe they never were, but they were there in the church. I mean, that's a, you gotta be prayed up to do that. They love to tell you to, you know, there's the door, see you later, don't wanna ever see you again. So what we do with a person like that is it's important that we come to that place of where they are in a spirit of humility being prayed up in Christ-like. <laughs> I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and there was a guy in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, there was a church there that was called Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And the pastor of that church was the, Dr. The James Kennedy. That's what I'd call him. G James Kennedy. He was the pastor of that church. And he started a program called Evangelism Explosion. And within that church, every Sunday, it was a massive church, and he started Evangelism Explosion. And I went with him for a week there in his church, uh, going out and sharing the gospel, Evangelism Explosion with people. And of course, one of the primary questions you would always ask a person, you know, if you were to die tonight and stand before the Lord, and the Lord were to say to you, why should I allow you into my heaven, what would you say? And so we were out one time, and James Kennedy was really a shy person, highly educated, um, strong, strong believer. But whenever he got ready to present the gospel to anybody, and he presented the gospel to heads of states, uh, royalty, presidents, he would always slap his knee like that. <laughs> in other words, you knew he was getting up his nerve and he's getting ready to charge in to share in the gospel. He'd slap that knee. And I remember one night we were down in Fort Lauderdale and, and this couple said, well, I'm concerned about all the heathen over in Africa that have never heard the gospel. Now you gotta be prayed up to do this. And this is what he said. The only heathen we're interested in tonight are the ones in this room. Wow. Wow, that will arrest your attention. 
And for whatever reason that night, it arrested their attention. And those people came to know Christ and came into that church. So that's a way in which sometimes the Lord leads us in a special way of presenting the gospel to people. I was preaching over in Seoul, Korea. And on a Sunday morning, as they picked me up to go preaching, I had no idea how many times I was going to have to preach that morning. But they, were, they told me, they said, we got five services. <laughs> I said, five services? And, and they were packed, thousands of people, thousands of people on Yoido Island. And I'll never forget during that week, we would go out witnessing. And I'd never seen anything like that because we in America don't do anything like this. They would literally take 10, 15 people with them from their church going into homes. Could you imagine that many people coming to your house? <laughs> and they would go in there and the first thing that they would do is they would sit around in that room with lost people and begin to pray with them about their receiving Christ. I said, my Lord, if we did that in America, they'd lock the door as soon as they saw us getting out of a car and seeing that many people coming towards the house, you know. But literally to see those people so committed so whenever James closes out this book, he's saying, listen, if someone is not of the faith or somebody's been in the church, but not a believer and they've fallen away, it's imperative that we as Christians be so prayed up in our lives that we are willing to go towards them to share the gospel. And that that person that we share the gospel with and they are saved and their lives are turned around, then that person, they are covered. They are covered in the blood of Christ. <laughs> Our love, what the Bible says in the book of Psalms, love covers a multitude of sins. Amen? A multitude of sins. Well, any additions, subtractions, multiplications, or divisions? That's when you get to respond. <laughs> Anybody got any questions about anything? Y'all are so quiet. Y'all didn't sleep on me tonight, did you? I mean, not too much. Anybody, anything, anything. God bless y'all are a sweet group of people. Y'all are fun to talk to, I'll tell you. Let's close in prayer tonight, and um, thank you for being here. We'll do something next Wednesday night. We're going to have a little short business meeting, vote on purchasing, getting this property, and then we will jump into something and uh, have a little fun together before we get back on normal schedules. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love and your grace to us. And Lord, we thank you so much that um, you continue to love us and to bless us and to take care of us. And Lord, as we leave this place tonight, every time there's someone that comes across our path, Lord, may we touch them with a smile. May we touch them with a laugh. Lord, may we touch them with just the joy of the Lord. And Lord, may we become so attractive as Christians that they would want to know more about our Jesus. And so, Lord, may we go from this place being missionaries and not a mission field as we might share Christ as we go being a people of fervent prayer in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go tonight.